All right, can we have our next speaker, please? Hello. Da -da -da -da. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Chandler. That was very powerful. Um, I don't think I'm going to give you anything anywhere near as powerful, so bear with on that one. Um, I'm Joey, and I'm a trans man. Not that I expect that to be shocking or any kind of big reveal, considering where we are. Um, I won't give you the long spiel about how I discovered who I am because it's a story that we've heard over and over again. I knew something wasn't quite right as a kid, figured out who I was as a teenager, then I began my transition and now I'm here as this great big fat guy you see before you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. So through some personal experience I'm hoping to break down some common misconceptions that we have around. First of all, there seems to be this idea that all you need to do is go to the GP and say, I think I might be trans, and they go, shut up and give me my hormones. <laughs> if only. <laughs> I first went to the GP when I was 16 to say that I was trans. I was then referred to children's mental health services and afterwards adult mental health services. Before I was finally referred to the gender identity clinic, from coming out as trans to being given my first dose of testosterone, this took six years. And those six years were not easy. I heard every possible theory for my transness. There were non-gender specialists like, well, you're fat, so maybe you just need to lose weight and then you'll be happy with your body and you won't be trans anymore. <laughs> no. I simultaneously heard that I was too pretty to be a boy and not pretty enough and that's why I wanted to be a boy. How is that making any sense? I was told that I was only, due to, I was only rejecting my femininity due to my mother dying of breast cancer when I was a child. And even have one doctor tell me that I had to have sex with a man and a woman to know my gender. I was 17 years old and I still identify as asexual. As a 17 year old, this was said to me and understandably I was not comfortable with the idea of engaging in sex with people. And yet I was told that I would have to engage in these sexual acts in order to get the treatment that I needed. How is that remotely acceptable? None of these theories thought, hey, this guy says he's a bloke, maybe he's trans. None of them involved that until I was referred to the GIC and then they were like, yeah, yeah, this is, this is pretty classic transness going on here. <laughs> But still I stand in front of you. My name is Joey. I've been living very openly as male for 11 years now. Woo! Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> my passport says male. My driving license says male. I'm well over two years. I'm nearly three years into my physical transition. It has a little bit of neck bitch got going on here in the lovely deep <laughs> But in order to legally be called my beautiful fiance's wife, I had to spend over 200 pounds to get a gender recognition certificate. Just for the privilege of being called a husband. And you know, my, my lovely partner. She's straight, she doesn't want a wife. Hence why she's into this great big hairy guy over here. <laughs> <laughs> But this is just proof that we shouldn't have the GRC in the first place. Why did it take me 200 pounds, even though everything says that I'm male, for them to go, oh, well, we have to go, it's on your birth certificate. A lot has changed since my birth certificate. I'm not eight pounds anymore. <laughs> <laughs> All right, secondly, I'd like to open up a little discussion about uh, toilets, my favorite subject. And I'll give you a little anecdote about a little time I used the public loo. I was at Gatwick Airport after a flight and needed a wee. I went into the men's and there's a queue. Trans horror story. A precious old man came up behind me and said, a urinal's free there, son. And ha, uh, I loved him. <laughs> and I said, uh, oh, oh, no, no, mate, I'm, I'm waiting for the stall over there, but, but thanks. And then he went over to the urinal, then came back to me and said, I think you're right, son, and got in the queue behind me. That's probably the best toilet story I've got. I've got loads. <laughs> but it's not always been that way. I have been assaulted and humiliated in public toilets. Twice I have been physically grabbed. 
and told I wasn't allowed in there. Once even laughed at when I said, no, I am a man. Both of these times were done by cisgender women cleaning male toilets. There are already people of multiple genders being allowed in multiple toilets. If a cisgender man wants to go into a female toilet, he just needs to wear a high vis and grab a mop. I think you all know where I go with this. My trans sisters, the women who feel more comfortable using a female toilet are by no means a threat and are in fact more vulnerable than anyone else. No one wants attention drawn to themselves in the bathroom. Which one of you last went into a public loo and thought, I hope someone really notices I'm about to have a piss. <laughs> <laughs> it's awkward enough having to use a public loo in the first place, right? I think we all prefer our home. If somebody enters the wrong one, they're gonna notice pretty freaking quick that they didn't mean to enter that one and will leave. By labeling my trans sisters a threat purely based on their transness gives rise to male vigilantes using this supposed protection as a means to attract trans women and they have far more in common with sex offenders than the trans women are being compared to. More than half of trans people have been sexually assaulted in their life. And this percentage increases dramatically when we talk about trans people of colour, particularly black trans people. You may be looking at this great big fat guy with an awkwardly growing beard and think, I'm, you know, I'm not the classic sexual assault victim, but I am. And it is all due to societal ideals about trans bodies being public property. The trans people's in bodies and experiences are simply concepts to be debating and that we are not living, breathing people. And that is all it comes down to, treating us as human beings. That's what we want. The idea of uh, not allowing a woman to attend to bodily functions based on how masculine she looks has in fact harmed women with butch cisgender lesbians and cis women over six feet tall being targeted based on appearance. This idea that women are somehow being protected by implementing extra standards of femininity and appearance blows my mind. There's a reason that JK Rowling has been criticized for her rampant transphobia, but has also been criticized for her anti-Semitic depictions of banking goblins, presenting homosexuality as an afterthought. By the way, Dumbledore's a firefighter now, okay? <laughs> presenting a race of slaves that are happy to be enslaved and saying that a character well oh, could be black I, I never really intended for her to have a race well describing her as having a white face so much transphobia is entrenched in white supremacy where we have seen erasure of non-binary identities especially culturally specific ones such as the Native American Two-Spirit and the Indian Hijira it's not just transphobia, it is racism as well. We need to break down our understanding. <laughs> we need to break down our understanding of gender. Step outside of our comfort zone. If you are a cis woman wanting to know what it's like to be trans, don't think, what if I wanted to be a man? Instead think, what if everyone was so convinced that I was a man instead of the woman I am that sometimes it's safer for me to pretend to be one? And overall, remember that our experiences are human experiences. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I would like to thank you all for listening. It does mean a lot. Thank you so much of you for coming out today and also for being responsible with social distancing and wearing masks. That is super. Uh, our next speaker, I believe, is Autumn, unless I've got it wrong. Hello. <laughs> Lovely man. On the wrong side of the post. Hello.